Do you know how bunkers play an important role in a charter party? What is an OR? What are the main reasons for off hire? In this video, we are going to check all of these things. Hey, what's up? Akash from Shipsco, bringing you the best platform to learn about the commercial shipping subjects. In the Chartering 101 series, we have seen the basics of chartering, we have seen the whole chartering process. We have even seen some additional terms used in chartering with legal terms too. In the previous lecture, we did see a whole charter party and saw relevant char chartering clauses. In this video, we'll be looking a bit deeper into this. If you're new here, consider subscribing it at any point of the time. Also check out the notes and links in the description below. And if you like the content guys, you can always go to my website and get the whole thing downloaded. For your information, it consists of comprehensive lecture notes, what we are going to present right now, uh, past ICS question papers and solved. And I have even have my own lecture notes, which will help you to understand this topic very well. So let's get in the video, shall we? Hi guys, welcome to Chartering 101. We are on lecture number six. And today's content, you are going to study about time charter hire, bunker ROB payments, balance bonus, off hire, freight, and finally we are going to conclude our lectures with the NOR, which is notice of readiness. Now, as we go ahead in this lecture, I have taken some particular case studies which will be relating to some of the topics here. So we will try to understand the legal aspects too. We will try to relate these things with the charter party clauses which we studied from the last lecture. Okay, so the first choice, time charter hire. Now, when I'm saying time charter, we need to understand guys that this is a time charter party where there are fixed cost and variable cost. The fixed cost are borne by the ship owner and the variable cost pertaining to a voyage is taken care by the charterer. Okay, so now in case of time charter hire, charter pays the owner a daily hire rate, which is let's say in this case is US $8,000 per day. So time charter hire is calculated and described in dry cargo charter parties as a daily rate. Okay. Thus for hire, it can be paid semi-monthly, which is like 15 days in advance for 30 days period, calendar per month or gross hire would amount. So let's imagine now 8,000, if we are taking 8,000, which is multiplied by 15, it gives us for 15 days, the hire is $120,000. Similarly, if it's paid in advance for a full calendar month, it will be 8,000 multiplied by 30, which will be 240,000 for the full calendar month. That is how the time charter hire is calculated. Now, when a vessel is delivered, not only does the time charter clock start to tick and it sets in the portion also the payment for the first hire or any additional sums as for bunker remaining on board. Now, BROP at that time and the ballast bonus. Now, we'll be looking into both of them, the BROB and the ballast bonus. Before that, let's understand one of the case studies, very interesting case studies by Chikuma, which happened in 1979. Uh, let's go through the facts now. The vessel was led on the NYP form, that's the charter party, for this, which was option to renew. The option to renew was exercised. Now, again, uh, before this, guys, uh, what I wanted to make you understand is when a vessel is committed on a time charter, it's committed for a specific amount of time, let's say one year, two year, three years. Okay. Now, what happens is when the vessel was fixed, there was a definite, you know, freight rate on which it was fixed. Now, at times what happens is this freight rates do fluctuate as the years come. And sometimes like when there is a possibility that they can renew the contract or, you know, there might be possibilities that there is a huge amount of volatility in the market where the freight rate might be, you know, very high and the ship owner wants to get as much as possible. So he might be finding loopholes in the contract so that he can take out his vessel. Similarly, if the freight rates are way lower, the charter would try to come out of the contract because he can't keep up paying the same amount. That is where these charter parties, the agreements come in, into play, the clauses which are there in these kinds of charter party, which make sure that the other party doesn't default. Now, in this case, Chikuma, th there was an option to renew, was exercised. The charter party provided that the payment of hire was to be made in cash for following which the owners would be at a liberty to withdraw the vessel from the service of the charter. If any payment, if they didn't get it, 
they could take out their vessel, the owners. Now, this was the 81st installment, which was which was due on 22nd of the January. The charters instructed the Norwegian banks to transfer the funds into owner's account, which was given on 21st itself. All the previous installments had been done punctually. They had never defaulted. Okay, The funds were transferred to the owner's bank account on 22nd. But what happened was the interest began to occur after four days, which is on 26th. And because of that, the owners instructed on 23rd to their bank that don't take any payments from the charter side. And on 24th, they withdrew their vessel from the services of the charter. Why did that happen? So the reason why interest was to occur on 26th was because of the telefax. Now this is telefax from the Italians correspondent to the charter is Norwegian to the owner's bank in Italy was to pay into the owner's account sum for hire with the rider that cover for the payment would only be provided on 26th why it happened what were the you know what were the further repercussions who won in this case was, was it what was the verdict for this you can always go into this onto this link and you can always read about it i mean i'll put the link in the description so let me know guys what you feel about it as we go ahead it is vital to specify where the delivery and redelivery is going to happen and they need to be mentioned in the charter party Charter party stipulates that the hire is payable monthly, semi-monthly as we studied in the earlier slide. This is where the clauses are being put into. Now, when we touch the topic bunkers, again, it's it's a very important topic, especially in the time charter party, because bunkers are being re-delivered and delivered. That itself, you know, has a cost. So, when a vessel is delivered, the charter will normally take over the bunkers remaining on board the vessel at the time when he took it and reimburse the owner ship o ship owner accordingly the payment usually made with the first hire payment so he will reimburse the amount with the first hire payment whatever it is subjected to now in case of re-delivery when the charter is re-delivering the vessel to the ship owner the reverse process takes place the charter estimating the quantity of bunkers remaining on board on re-deliver re he estimates he carries out the survey and he deducts the equivalent monetary amount for the final payment. The price of the bunker shall be by the net contract price paid by the receiving party evident by the supplier invoice. Alternatively, it may be the price at the port of delivery or re-delivery. Charters to provide the bunkers of agreed specification. Again, this is very important. Which specifications, what grade should be taken into consideration. We are getting into ballast bonus. Now, in case a ship needs to sail some distance empty in order to arrive at the place of time charter delivery, the owner may negotiate a position bonus to cover the time and expenses. Bunker cost or canal toll incurred between the departure from the original position of the vessel delivery under the new employment. Such a lump sum payment is termed a ballast bonus and a delivery ballast bonus is usually payable in full together with the first hire due to the due under the new time chart. So I'll, I'll try to explain you in very simpler words, guys. So ballast bonus is paid to ship owners from charters because for positioning their ship in ballast condition. A lump sum amount is normally paid to the ship owner, usually as a reward for positioning his vessel to a certain place as a prerequisite for the delivery to the charter because as you know in in case of time charter the vessel is being delivered from ship owner to the charter so i'll give you an instance where uh, let's say charter wants loading at singapore the whole contract between the ship owner and charter is fixed on a time charter period for one year and charter wants the loading happening first load port is at singapore and presently the vessel is at japan so the charter gives let's say 500 thousand dollars as a ballast bonus or as bunker cost for the ballast voyage from japan to singapore so this itself is called as ballast bonus or fire now what is war fire when does it happen now in case it is an event what is an off fire is it's an event that hinders or prevents the normal operation of the vessel and deprives the charter of its use through no fault of this 
their own higher is suspended in respect to the time lost and higher paid in advance is adjusted accordingly the list of incidents which trigger the off hire causes generally includes breakdown of machinery damage to hull deficiency or default of men store there are various conditions if you see in the charter party form there are list of conditions when an off hire can happen i would like to give you my own example so i was sailing uh, on tankers and it it so happened that when we were at discharging port in case of tankers there is a system called as inert gas system and you are supposed to fill the tanks with ig when you are discharging so that generator got switched off and we were not able to rectify that and that itself is again a major off hire so if we are not able to you know give the vessel to the charterer and he is not able to discharge the cargo with the given stipulated time as agreed in the charter party it turns out to be a off hire so again it's one of the causes it comes under that uh, the list may be extended to cover other accidents as well other similar causes preventing the full working of the vessel the rule may come into effect when delays continue for more than 24 hours now this is in ball time once the threshold is exceeded the whole period of the delay is time of hire thus with a delay of 30 hours in ball time charter party then we have deviation deviation also plays a very very important role in case of off hire it is a di diversion of a vessel plan course and it's necessary to make the deviation calculation so as to assess the cost of higher incidents the deviation is normally calculated by the captain of the ship guys and it is directly sent to both the parties which is owners and charterers and will cover what time extra time has been consumed and the bunkers used for that again we have very interesting case regarding how the payment of hire was to cease if the if the vessel stopped until the efficient services resumed in this case what happened uh, i i would rather recommend you guys go to this link and read it by yourself freight freight is the primary payment obligation arising under a void charter the obligation represents a fixed price of carriage of particular cargo or cargoes on a particular voyage paid in us dollars such price normally includes the owner's operating cost cost of fuel consumed passages between ports and the owner's profit margin so it is being paid from charter to the ship owner under the charter party contract freight is paid by the charterer to the owner as a remuneration for the services the owner provides to the charter therefore no obligation to pay freight arises when a ship owner fails to provide the services or transportation namely transportation of goods by the sea thus no freight is due for the example for example if the carriage voyage has never begun or the owner has not delivered goods to its destination delay of delivery of the goods to the contracted destination is again a very very important key characteristic in order to perform this contract we have nor this is the last topic which we are going to cover in this and very important topic okay there is a notice to the charterer or it can be a shipper it can be a receiver or any other person who is required by the charterer that the ship has arrived at the port berth as the case may be and is ready to go for the loading and discharging operations the giving and acceptance of the nor is important in void charters because it is one of the events that causes that cause lay time to commence the the nor the whole purpose of nor is to make sure that it's used for the calculation of lay time when does the lay time commence that is where the nor is taken into consideration the nor is also important because it is a series to give information to charter or shipper in sufficient time to allow preparations to be made for loading the notice of readiness clause should be quite precise because it triggers of the commencement of lay time if the lay time is intended to commence on the happening of an event such as the notification of the vessel readiness the occurrence of that event must be known with a certain or else disputes can arise as to the time that count against the charter and therefore the dremerage or the dispatch that may be payable who tenders it the master the captain tenders it the notice of readiness does not make the document a notice of readiness if the ship has not arrived it needs to arrive at the agreed destination as stipulated in the charter party or if can it can be a destination or it can be a boat or it can be a port charter party or it can be a boat charter party which we studied in our previous lectures
It also does not become a NOR if the ship is not physically or legally ready to load and discharge. How does it look like? This is how an NOR looks like. It has name of the vessel, which port, what voyage number, to whom it has been addressed to, and what kind of quantity it's ready to load, the loading one, the date, the time, and signature of the master. In the absence of a charter, express a reservation of its rights or rejection on an invalid NOR given under a charter party, the commencement of the cargo operations can amount to a waiver of the NOR invalidated by the charters, thereby starting the lay time. We would study two cases in this case, the front commander and the happy day. Now, in case, what are the facts for the happy day? In the happy day, the voyage charter was on birth charter, number one. A valid NOR could only be given when the vessel was securely moved at birth because it's a birth charter party. The master gave an NOR when the charter was waiting for the tide birth. But ship missed the tide and was unable to enter the port. No further notice of readiness was given. The vessel then berthed and started discharging the next day. After three months, the charter argued that no valid NOR was given and therefore the lay time never started. Now, what are the argued facts? Was the further NOR required? And when did the NOR actually commence? These were the two things which came, in, came into light. This is where the verdict happened. You know, I would like you guys to read about it in depth. And let me know in the comment section below that what do you think? Who won? Why? Why did they? You know, what were the relevant points? Uh, the other one, very beautiful case is the front commander. So I'll just give you a brief hint. What happened was the lay can was given on the 9th of January, but the vessel arrived a bit earlier. It arrived on the 6th and they said that, you know, they were ready to load. So there were a lot of communication which happened between the ship owner and the charter between 6th and 7th of January. And finally, they started loading on 8th, which was before the lay can. So as I said, on instruction of terminal, the vessel boat and started to load on 16, at 1648 on the 8th of January. Now, what happened was owners submitted a demerage claim to the charters and a dispute arose. So, what were the agreed issues? The first one was, if or when the NOR given on 8th became effective for the purpose of the commencement of lay time, because the lay can was on 9th, at what date and time lay time commenced? Whether the charter by their emails on 6th and 7th or by commencing loading consented to lay time commencing prior to the first day of the lay can, which was 9th of January. There's a big chaos which happened in this. I would like you guys to go to the following link, read it by yourself and let me know in the comment section below what, what were the verdicts and do you really feel that was it right that whether the charter won or the ship owner won in this case. So it's really interesting when you understand the topic and read about the relevant case law. With this, I would like to finish off my lecture number six. I hope you like. Since we have finished our lecture, I would love to hear out from you guys in the comment section below. Uh, hit the like button if you like it. And remember guys, one of the most important tips and feedbacks come from you. So feel free to connect me on LinkedIn. So thanks for checking out the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. In the next lecture, we are going to see the late time. Until next time, Shipscope brings you the best platform to learn about the commercial shipping subjects. Keep on crushing it and we will talk soon.